Learn from one of the key scientists who developed the biotic pump theory, how healthy ecosystems and especially healthy forests regulate moisture and thus rain. We discuss tipping points, where to look for wet spots even in very dry landscapes. Why not all hope is lost? We still have massive healthy forests, but they need to be protected immediately. Not only because of the carbon, the biodiversity, but because they regulate our global weather systems. From floods to droughts, from cyclones to hail, all depends on healthy ecosystems. We learn how rain gets created, and it's not like you learned in high school, and where she would focus her investments if she would be an investor. Focus on the most degraded pieces of land, because otherwise you might end up taking very productive, albeit propped up by fossil fuel inputs, land out of production in the global rich north, and create little pieces of Eden with a healthy, diverse food forest, I'm generalizing here of course, while the industrial ag machine moves to other countries and continents to drive havoc there, meaning in Russia, Ukraine, Brazil, etc. Enjoy! If it's true that water vapor accounts for 60 to 70% of the greenhouse effect, while CO2 only accounts for 25, why do we rarely discuss it? Maybe we choose to ignore it because it means we literally need to revegetate the entire earth. Bring back the marshes, the mangroves, the perennial pastures with trees, and regrow real forests that can bring back rain in strategic places. In short, bring back life, lots of plants, trees, animals back to many places on this earth. Natural climate engineering. It is time we take our role as keystone species super seriously. In this special water cycle series, we interview the dreamers and the doers who are using the latest technology to figure out where to intervene first. They're making or trying to make the investment and return calculations and plans. So what's missing? What's holding us back? Maybe we lack the imagination to back them and try regeneration at scale. We're thankful for the support of the Nest family office in order to make this series. The Nest is a family office dedicated to building a more resilient food system through supporting natural solutions and innovative technologies that change the way we produce food. You can find out more on the Nest FO, that is nestfo.com. Welcome to another episode, today with someone from the theoretical physics departments of the Petersburg Nuclear Physics Institute and has a fellowship at the University of Munich. Welcome, Anastasia. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. And today is going to be a, an interesting dance because we're going to go deep or not super deep, but deep enough that, that I can still follow uh, into physics, into weather patterns, into a lot of things that I'm going to have to ask. Could you please explain that again? Because I didn't grasp it. Um, if you want to go deep into this topic, there's some fascinating, very, very interesting, uh, longer interviews with you as well. So I, I invite everybody to go into that. I will put them in the show notes below. But today I want to focus on um, what this means for the investment community, for, for finance, what it means for farmers and what it means for, for entrepreneurs. So I'm very, very happy to have you here. But for anybody that doesn't know your amazing work, um, could you share a bit when you rolled into literally this work and when you started to focus on syntropic agriculture, we just talked about it when you started focusing on soil, when it, when it hits you basically, because from a nuclear um, physics department, it's quite a step to agriculture and soil. Like, do you remember when all those things started to connect? Mm. Uh, well, uh, well, I need to clarify a little bit uh, because my work is not exactly about syntropic uh, agriculture, syntropic restoration, but uh, my research is devoted uh, to the role uh, ecosystems and especially forest ecosystems play in atmospheric moisture transport. And this is crucial for syntropic agriculture, for agriculture in general, and for generally for all life on land. And um, uh, I came quite naturally to this topic uh, because I have a PhD in atmospheric physics, but I have been always interested in how natural ecosystems uh, stabilize and regulate the climate and the environment. And um, so more recently, 
uh, as uh, moisture and water is a crucial element of life on land. We turned uh, with my colleagues to studying this role of the forests and other ecosystems in moisture transport. And, and moisture transport could lead to rain, could lead to, let's say, um, yes, yes, effects yes. that are, pro- that are, are relevant, very relevant for forest. And of course, all the land around it and before, like it's a uh, moisture transport is a, um, it, it's not big, it's not irrigation pipes, let's say. Uh, not, not, no, it's not irrigation, but this is something, you know, as you are talking about people who put their money into like natural systems to produce food and all that, uh, it is absolutely crucial that the knowledge of the water cycle and the role of moisture transport is um, part of their decision making framework like, picture yeah. of the world yeah. and decision making yes uh, concepts because why moisture transport we know that land is elevated over the ocean and we know that there is gravity so land is continuously losing water it is like you know you have we have a store of water liquid water on land but if we do nothing uh, just question to you what do you think how fast uh, how quickly would uh, the rivers deplete all fresh water store on land probably very quickly so you're saying if we don't do any if there's no Water transport. Uh, yes, if there are no compensating uh, transport moisture of moisture from the ocean, they would deplete uh, the in a matter of weeks. Total matter of sto- in, in a matter of a few years. Wow, okay. just a few years. Yeah. So, so any it means long all the big term, big lakes means all the the, the yes, storage. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, and most most uh, moisture is um, on the soil. Mm-hmm. In soil, yeah. So, so we do need this uh, uh, compensating moisture transport from the ocean, which occurs via the atmosphere. So, water vapor evaporates from the ocean and is brought by winds to overland. But this is not the whole story. Because this was the story. Just so, so this was the story that we we've learned probably when when you were looking in textbooks, when you were in in high school or middle school. And you say, okay, there's evaporation on the oceans, then there's wind coming or it gets pulled onto land and then it rains uh, against maybe when, when it goes up to elevation, if, if you look that far. And that was sort of the whole story we told ourselves. And you are one of the people that said, oh, actually, that's only a part and actually in many places, not the biggest part of the story. Yes, exactly. And as you mentioned, for there to be rain, the air, not moist air, not just have to uh, come to land, but it also must rise. And uh, we know, yes, if it hits an elevation, it will rise, but there are no elevations present everywhere. So, uh, in a way, um, the role, uh, what we show in our work is that forests can regulate this process of moisture transport by modifying both the horizontal wind and the ascending air motion when there is already a horizontal wind. And this is uh, what we term the biotic pump of atmospheric moisture. And uh, this concept says that when you have a healthy forest, a natural forest uh, of sufficient size, then it regulates this moisture transport by moistening the atmosphere, by transpiration. So we know when that when there is a photosynthesis, photosynthesis, there is a lot of water vapor emitted to the atmosphere, like a few hundred water vapor molecules per every CO2 molecule fixed. So this transpiration moistens the atmosphere and due to physical properties of the atmosphere, a moist atmosphere is ready to, moist air is ready to rise and to uh, initiate all this process of the pressure drop with condensation and the uh, ascending air motion and the horizontal inflow of moist air, which compensates for the loss of liquid water with stream flow. So that's um, that's the main point. So the healthy forest basically 
so the wind is are coming anyway, but the healthy forest triggers, let's say, the pool of of moisture air coming from the oceans and and doesn't have to be even that close it can be relatively far from the large water body and then because it evaporates so much as well it adds a lot of this moisture to um to the air and it also not only evaporates but also releases a lot of other substance that could trigger the rain or not i think there's but it needs to be sufficient size and sufficient healthy it cannot be a monoculture of pine trees or, or something like that and i think there's a there's a fascinating point there is that the trees and the forest because it actually triggers the rain and creates a big chunk of the rain instead of just receiving the rain and then grow further which was sort of the theory we had like it's rain oh, then it grows the forest now actually the rain creates partly triggers pools and sort of nudges the the moist air to come over it and and then also charges even more because of the operation and to rise and, of and to rise, rise it pushes it up yes 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 so you can uh, we can view it uh, you know as an uh, from the forest side we can view transpiration as an investment because we have a capital which uh, uh, is the soil moisture uh, store so we have a capital in soil and if we do nothing then inflation will eat it away and inflation is the stream flow loss of water to, to the, the ocean, ocean okay. eventually okay yeah. so so the forest to to remain wealthy in terms of water it must invest and how does it invest it transpires a certain part of soil moisture into the atmosphere and if it makes it moist enough this atmosphere is giving a return <laughs> the moist air begins to ascend to rise then there is condensation of water vapor then there is drop of pressure which facilitates horizontal inflow of air from the ocean which brings more moisture than the forest has transpired so this investment must be wise in the sense that the return the moisture that forest gets uh, from this is greater than the stream flow and the investment itself. And this is how it works. And imagine if we replace the wise forest with a like a stupid monoculture, which will be transpiring when it is it shouldn't be or transpires the wrong amount. So then we can just lose all the capital. And the soil dries up. See, and the soil dries up, yes, yes. So you're so, saying the forest actually starts the process even so the forest is a smart but should think and decides when and how much of its capital the the, the water or the, the moisture in the soil it wants to draw out through root systems wants to evaporate and then it makes i'm mean, gonna say it makes a, a conscious decision but of course that wouldn't do it a healthy forest wouldn't do it if there's not enough coming from the ocean if it cannot pull an interesting amount that actually replaces what it evaporates and a bit more so it's actually it's a form of economy and the, the currency is the the moisture um, and monoculture forests are sort of are, are stupid investors like you said they are the moment they, they make the wrong investment at the wrong time and, and they will never be able to pull any moisture or not enough moisture to replace what they have basically lost over time. And they will slowly um, descend into into dryness. Fascinating metaphor. Yes. And yes. And as for any investor, uh, there is a context. So every forest has evolved in its particular geographic re uh, region where there are certain geophysical moisture flows and uh, there is a certain um, uh, geophysical um, certain geophysical conditions because we know that there is a strong player which is the ocean and condensation and evaporation also occurs over the ocean so all uh, what we said about the forest could be said about the ocean except for the fact that oceanic ecosystems don't care about fresh water they have enough of water and so they don't evolve any mechanism to regulate uh, uh, this uh, resource which they have in abundance and so because there is so much water in the ocean so much condensation there is a certain tug of war between the ocean and the forest. The forest must... They must pull because otherwise they won't survive. There yeah. is more yeah. 
pull, yes, pull against the ocean. And this is tricky because uh, the geophysical conditions, the um, uh, circulation cells, uh, which the Hadley cells, the feral cells, the pull cells, they work their own uh, in the according to their own physical rules. And the forest must have evolved how to cope, how to make its investments in the in the best possible way to ensure uh, not only sufficient, but also um, uh, regular moisture import uh, to minimize fluctuations, to minimize volatility, you would say in the market. Yes, yes, volatility, yes, such that it can uh, like foresee a reliable moisture import for itself. And that's only. That's also when we replace forest with something, uh, we see uh, growing fluctuations of the moisture transport. When there is no regulation of condensation events, they can get very uh, wild, very intense. Which is what we're seeing. I would say the whole July, we're recording this at the end of July uh, 2023, the whole June and July actually around the world. I don't think there's a place uh, where it has been uh, relatively regular. And what does it mean then for land use and restoration? I mean, we mentioned Syntropic a bit at the beginning. Um, A lot of the big healthy forests are either gone or severely damaged. Um, do we is is our only path to bring them back in 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 a sense of an extremely large and healthy forest, or other other ways? Uh, of course, not the monoculture pine trees, uh, but other ways to to vegetate enough or to trigger or to help condensate um, in a way that we can also not only grow timber, but like what what do you see in the role of restoration and regeneration for for the forest, but also the pieces between the forest and the ocean or the large mm. water body, which is where we usually farm, live, cities, etc. Um, first of all, I must say that we have not yet lost all the forests. And this is important because in the northern uh, hemisphere, we have this huge boreal and temperate forest belt the biggest forest in Canada in the world. Yeah. and yeah. Russia. Yeah. And, and if we look at the root of the weather systems in our hemisphere, you will see that they f- uh, coincide with this forest belt. And what is going on there makes a strong impact on how these weather systems move. So when we have, a, for example, in Russia, we have a b- big logging and the forest, the logged forest rapidly dries out and warms rapidly, and there are fires. This disrupts the normal flow of air and moisture. And globally, that's let's like it's not that globally. There's not massive fires air. in Russia, and you're thinking, oh yeah, that's that's very bad, but it yes, actually because, because destroys your system. Interconnected, yeah. and imagine a heat wave that would sit, say, in France for two days, but then it would go. Now, because of this disruption somewhere in Siberia, this heat wave, this blocking system, just sits where it is for like two weeks, three weeks, and then we have these terrible uh, uh, extremes that would not have happened if there was a normal uh, flow of air. So this is very important, and this I would like uh, to communicate to all people who are listening, that we still have this forest belt, and it is of utmost importance for all people, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. I Even especially in China, which also received moisture from Eurasia. So uh, we need uh, to uh, reconsider our um, appreciation of how interconnected we are via the vegetation, (laughs) via forest belt. And uh, we need... um, international efforts to preserve uh, this just as a guarantee for 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 the success of all other our other efforts because as we are doing regenerative agriculture in one place but there comes a heat wave and sits with temperature like above 45 
it is beyond what plants can tolerate. So we need to move into direction, in the strategic direction, uh, preserving what we still have. And we, it is, I, I promise you, we are not at the bottom yet. There is what to preserve now. And if we just stop uh, doing what we are doing to boral forests at the moment, it could uh, significantly uh, alleviate and improve our conditions. At least, at least uh, prevent it from rapidly worsening. So, and and then worse, to yeah. your yeah, from getting worse. So that's very important. Uh, and um, we see these initiatives growing also in the United States. Uh, there was such an initiative called proforestation, which means identify the forests that are self-sustainable and let them in peace to develop to their full ecological potential when they can regulate climate and water in the best possible way that is um, genetically encoded, uh, has been genetically encoded into them in the course of evolution. Proforestation. The same in Russia, we are trying with our colleagues to to set aside those self-sustainable forests who perform this regulatory function such that they could continue doing that. And this should be the focus of international efforts and and investors, uh, because there should be lobbying. I don't know, perhaps shadow lobbying for for this cause, because it is really important. And if if we don't do that, all our local and regional efforts can be undermined. That, uh, can be undermined and investments lost. So this is like an elephant in the room, which nobody talks about, but it is there. So the deforestation just, uh, and and disruption of local ecosystems globally, but especially these specific hotspots, are already disrupting. And if they continue, will disrupt way more. Um, any efforts we do there, because like you said, if, if a heat wave hits the most amazing regeneratively focused farm, etc., if, if you get 45 degrees and, and either you get a big fire or, or the plants just die and, and, and stop. So there's, um, there's more, there's way more we should do beyond the farm gate and beyond whatever size farm you have, because you're, you're being affected by what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Canada, what's happening in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, what's happening in in Peru, etc., um, and and so we should really take a, a holistic context. So take that into into account. And you need a well functioning, well balanced uh, weather system, which we don't have at the moment. And but and you're saying this is nothing yet. Like we haven't hit the bottom at all because there's still so much left. Meaning there can be still so much be cut and and disrupted. Exactly. And if we stop doing that, the forest will uh, still regrow because uh, many forests have still the potential to self-recover. We don't need planting. We just need to a little bit of protection. And also we need to think every time when we want to go green, right? <laughs> and we decide, let us go green and let us like import timber from Russia instead of using coal. But this could be, uh, we won't uh, improve our weather systems with that, quite on the contrary. So we should do everything that we can regarding fossil fuels and that, but not just not touching natural ecosystems, just not touching them. It, it is, uh, we are already on the brink uh, with them. So this is, it is not a renewable resource. It is a mechanism that works for us. And if we destroy it, <laughs> uh, we have, we are in trouble. And now returning to your question about centropic uh, restoration, what is important to understand uh, when, when we do, when we try to restore uh, the uh, like yeah the pieces um, that are already degraded. What do we do? There? Yes, yes, the, the degraded uh, pieces. Um, like uh, we were now in uh, last week, we were in Cognac, uh, and um, there some local stakeholders want to 
know how bad or how good uh, their conditions are in terms of climate change. And one can see that uh, not all places are equal and some suffer more and some others less than the others uh, in, in terms of what is going on. And of course, the proximity to the sea is a good thing because... Uh, the, when you say proximity, how close? Like, how close have you seen how effect? Close yeah, but but is... what what is a good? Like, is it is is mm-hmm. five hundred kilometers too far? Is it better to have a hundred? Like, what's in terms of ability to attract this, moisture? This, what is ideal? Yeah, yeah. This this depends also on geophysical conditions on how uh, the geophysical uh, winds uh, without vegetation would blow, and of course, uh, if uh, you are. It, uh, uh, when, uh, like on the route of the prevailing wind, uh, it is better than then you are on uh, begin your restoration, <laughs> like yeah. against the winds that blow from land to the ocean. So it depends. But uh, naturally, uh, uh, we uh, found that in the absence of vegetation, precipitation declines by three times over uh, like uh, a few hundred kilometers. So a hundred kilometers is something that is close yeah, like yeah. enough. Yeah. So, and Europe and this um, context small, is a very so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that's why this culture, I mean, culture and quotes of... She's doing air quotes for any listeners. Forest, yeah. <laughs> yes, could be, uh, could be ingrained uh, and didn't uh, lead to... Uh, complete destruction of regional climate because it is so close. But when it was exported to other regions of the world, it was a disaster. So, so in many cases. So, so, but what we need to uh, have in mind uh, when attempting to restore uh, uh, an ecosystem, there are two regimes. Uh, uh, like when we were talking about the investment. When the forest adds moisture to the atmosphere, the idea is to initiate condensation so so that you must reach 100% relative humidity. If uh, And then there is precipitation, then there is the pressure drop, the dynamics, incoming moisture, uh, moist air, and everything could be uh, as, as needed. But imagine that... It, there is a very dry atmosphere and the forest adds moisture to this dry atmosphere, but the dew point is never reached. The humidity remains on low, relative humidity, and no condensation is initiated. Then all this moisture could be just blown away by the wind and the investment will be lost. And so in this dry regime, the, the vegetation relies on the moisture store and and if nothing happens it will just uh, deplete the store and that's it so in this dry regime um it is not self-sustainable and on the other hand if you increase the amount of vegetation to a point that the transpiration is so strong that it sufficiently moistens the atmosphere then the process of condensation is switched on and you get something, at least something in return. So it means that there is a tipping point between the dry and the wet regime. And when we restore the ecosystem, we must carefully guide it through this tipping point. So uh, we first of all, we need to understand that it exists and that for the ecosystem to to, to come to the wet side, it must, it may need a lot of help uh, during this transition in terms of, for example, irrigation, like so, uh, because to get it, the plants to grow, yes, yeah. uh, yes, yes, <laughs> irrigation, or or like uh, when we talk about syntropic restoration, this is about the choice of species. Uh, what our colleagues uh, Felipe Passini and Diana Andrade are doing there, mimicking uh, natural ecological succession in the region, which uh, actually uh, consists in choosing carefully the species that would um, um, 
accumulate moisture in soil, like uh, minimize all other expenditures except transpiration. So there is no evaporation from soil for, to nowhere, right? So using uh, moisture very sparingly. And then gradually as this soil moisture store develops and the conditions improve and probably the trees get access to lower levels of, then uh, the species composition changes to more active transpiration and uh, Probably at a certain point, guiding to that, guiding to, to that, the wet, uh, to to the wet regime. Point. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, this is very important to keep in mind because these two regimes is what uh, causes controversy in people's perception whether trees improve or uh, suck. Like, <laughs> yeah, Ex- or, extract, or, 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 extract or, water. Or, yeah. Whether they add to the water cycle or, uh, on the contrary, take from it. And, and you're saying are, it depends on the two yeah, regime, it, which it, regime you're yes, in. Yes, it depends on the, on the weather the ecosystem in the wet or dry regime. And what is interesting that we have come to this com- conclusion purely from physical, uh, physical like, um, considerations and data analysis and uh, but what is interesting that in parallel we found that in the literature uh, people uh, introduced some Australian researchers Professor Lindenmeyer introduced this parallel concept in ecology which they called landscape trap and this landscape trap corresponds to the dry regime it is when you have a forest which may be uh, like um, self-sufficient in terms of water. It can suffer from periodic fires, but it is part of natural dynamics. But when you uh, uh, cut too much uh, this forest, it loses its ability to control the water cycle, and it turns to a stage when it cannot recover. So it, it, it is... It spirals, the ecosystem spirals Down. to complete degradation. So no recovery, which is called, they called it landscape trap. And this corresponds to the dry regime. Whatever you do, you just lose. So this is what... Uh, uh, I think many people feel like they're in an area where that's happening. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Whatever yes, you yes. try, you just it, seem to lose. So, so yes. And, um, and this means that uh, the first thing that we should do when we attempt uh, restoration in a dry place is to uh, change the landscape to keep as much moisture which comes, uh, sometimes at least, in the landscape. So uh, it is not about planting trees. Planting trees is the last thing to do. The first thing in a dry landscape is to... um, to keep water in landscape, because in the absence of uh, ecosystem control, precipitation is irregular and it comes in pulses, uh, sometimes very intense, intense rain. Capture as much as possible and, and keep it in. Yes, yes, most of it is lost. Uh, uh, keeping as much as possible of this rain is the first, absolutely first measure. And uh, there are many good practices, like... Um, like working as beavers, <laughs> if there is a stream flow. So this is uh, this is uh, the first thing to think about. Yeah. And then, in c- coming back to the cognac, w- what did you see there, and what did you you mentioned? It's not that far from a from a large water body. In this case, yes. the Atlantic Ocean, and it's semi dry, I think. Or it's it like where um, in, in what regime is the cognac, and, and what did you see there? Uh, uh, it, in this case, we were able to tell them that they actually uh, uh, the last in the queue for the trouble because uh, <laughs> yes, they are in the queue as we all are, but they are not uh, in the first row because uh, when you look uh, at the temperature trends uh, in um, in the region, you will notice that uh, temperature increases um, less 
at the coastal zone, including Konyak, uh, than in the more continental zone. So, so, and this means that the temperature contrast between the ocean and land increases much faster in the continental part, like in Czech mm-hmm. Republic, for example, uh, then, then in the coastal zone. And what does it mean? When the land is dry, the atmosphere is dry, very warm, and the ocean is uh, cold, relatively, right? And, red, and yeah. even if the air comes, as the geophysics they stay over the land, but it warms, and it means that the relative humidity decreases, and there is no condensation. So this uh, growing uh, um, temperature Divide, contrast yeah. between land and mm-hmm. ocean uh, works against an efficient moisture transport. But for cognac, it is still minimal. So they are, like you told them, close to this tipping point. And so even very small improvements in what they are doing with their land, for example, covering the vineyards with the... So do, crops, doing uh, away yeah. with yeah. the bare soil, <laughs> which is which is like you just... Uh, throw away water vapor through this bare soil. So covering the crops or they want to introduce like trees. Or, so when you are near the tipping point, small improvements or small or even small bad things could drive you to one or other regime. So it is something where what you do locally matters a lot. When you are deeply in the dry regime or or safely in the wet like regime, Central Europe, you, yeah. you can yeah. like uh, more or less. Uh, but when you do, say they're close to the tipping point, what? How do you how do you know that, or how do you measure that, or how do you calculate? Like, okay, you're actually because because we did uh, we did research um, uh, this. Of course, until it dries completely out, we can't make an experiment, right? And see, but from the uh, from our research, we just calculated the temperature contrast that would block. Uh, the moisture transport is controlled by the ecosystem. And Western Europe is uh, very close. The observed temperature contrast is very close to this uh, uh, threshold. And we see that cognac is uh, precisely at this small um, uh, magnitude, which corresponds to this tipping point. So that's, that's how we... Um, but they also see uh, f- this is confirmed by their um, uh, like complaints. They don't have any um, very well articulated complaints, like totally lost uh, yield or something like. They have like something is wrong is going on. Yeah, some that, annoyance, yes, some something yeah. weird. Oh, yeah. there was a hail. So, so they got concerned at the very right moment. <laughs> Not they are really very clever stakeholders, I must say, and they want to be ahead of problems. Uh, so that's uh, was. Mm-hmm. And and would that in that system then go to going towards Central Europe as well? Like, would that be? Do you go like from tipping to point to tipping point in restoration? Like you say, okay, first we take the piece closest, we we focus closest to um, to the large water body, in this case, the Atlantic Ocean. Just for people, Cognac is like in the middle of France, close to the middle um, west part of France. And, and then you go further, like do you have to go like as a domino or do you need to do the full water shed at once? Like what's the order? Because if you do it in the wrong order, maybe you don't trigger anything. Well, uh, well, of course, if we go from the ocean inland, uh, that, then we will repeat uh, the path that le- that terrestrial life took when it evolved from the sea. Okay, there was no life, Fair point. Uh, yeah. no big uh, life <laughs> yeah. on land, so that would work. But at the same time, uh, we cannot wait. <laughs> so, 
so long. So even inland, we can look for what we call wet spots. Uh, and this is these are uh, uh, spots or regions or locations where uh, conditions for rainfall are um, good from the geophysical point of view. Uh, these are some like elevations uh, on the when when the our dominant west to east airflow rises for some reason, like when it hits an elevation. And there are also like wet spots, even in Saudi Arabia, if you look uh, like on the southern, west southern part, there is a small elevation, there is some, uh, and even in the within the desert, you can search for such wet spots. And if we analyze the circulation in, around such, and have a picture of what is going on, then we could choose the proper vegetation types and to try to improve starting from there. And then it it will meet what we are doing from the coast. So uh, it is not uh, hopeless. There are also, also there are uh, like, uh, for example, in Czech Republic, they have a very well-developed uh, system of artificial lakes that are, 500 years old, so they have a system of management. So actually, there is a store of moisture from which to start to to help uh, to help the region self restore. It is not Europe is strategically in a good position, so it really did take a lot of effort to get it into this miserable state as it is now. A lot of effort from our civilization. So basically, we were very lucky in Europe that we, we had such a favorable conditions and we tried our best, but we, with enormous effort to, to destroy it, then we exported that. We, we almost succeeded. We didn't succeed completely, but at least we didn't completely destroy everything. Then we exported the methods and in other places, of course, that were maybe closer to the tipping points or just less, um, less favorable or, or more fragile. Uh, it did enormous damage uh, the the systems we've we've exported, and then the, what would you do if you would be in in the seat of an investor? Like I love to ask the question, uh, what would you do if you had to invest? So invest, which means there should be a return, but it could be extremely long. It could be 20, 30, 40, 50 years investments. Uh, you already said we're running out of time. So I'm, I'm guessing you want to speed things up. But what if you had to invest a billion euros or a billion dollars? Uh, could be anywhere in the world, could be in technology, could be in land, could be in products, uh, whatever you choose, could be partly in lobbying as well to help the investment. But if you had, um, I would say, almost unlimited resources, what would you prioritize? Where would you focus? Well, yes, I had this question from you, and so I have been thinking a little bit. Uh, so, uh, what I would do, uh, I would use this money uh, to uh, uh, to find out very specifically who is taking decisions uh, about. Uh, what to do with the ecosystems, who is like in charge of this globally and target specifically these people with a certain amount of education about what these ecosystems actually mean. So, so I would actually do some like secret <laughs> networking uh, because currently this topic is underappreciated by whoever is taking decisions. Mindset shift. And it would yeah. require a certain effort to identify them and, 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 and to change their minds. Because really, with all due respect, we are heading in the wrong direction. So you would focus on... Yeah. The climate change. Sorry, go ahead. And also what we want... what Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also what we want to keep in mind, now I see that what is going on uh, now um, there is a demand. First, we have this um, division between the very rich and very poor, and it grows. And among the wealthy people, uh, there is a growing demand for healthy food. 
And for healthy food, as we know, it requires a lot of labor. So we must understand, if we want to eat healthy food, we should radically increase in uh, labor uh, investments. We should all go back to work on land. Not all, but many of us. But this also requires a lot of land. And I see that there are efforts to make certain, uh, like... Um, sports where this healthy food will be growing and one sport is europe like i was in germany in this february in munich uh, they were discussing on a very high level that what on earth we are doing we are feeding the total uh, entire world with our intense agriculture but our soil is uh, destroying and we should really slow down. Then in France, we have these complaints that they like shut off all cattle farming. And so, so, so there is a slowdown. Why? Because if you need to grow healthy food, you need to slow down. That's for sure. But this will export ecological disaster elsewhere because there are like almost 10 billion people to feed. And so now there are hotspots of this ecological disaster being formed. And this is Russia, where big egg will be flourishing. Russia, Ukraine, and probably also Brazil, where the Amazon forest will be destroyed. So those who are preparing, and ah, and in the US, now it is on the rise. Let's make American rivers clean again, uh, kiss the ground, uh, all that. So America wants also to recreate Adam. So the developed countries, like <laughs> moving up on the, this mass low pyramid, they suddenly realized, oh, we need healthy ecosystems to thrive. And now they want to recreate Adam in their, which they destroyed. But uh, this will inevitably create uh, the same mess uh, elsewhere. Destruction elsewhere. Uh, yes, yes. So we need at least to understand that this will go on and uh, somehow take it into account. Because, for example, in Ukraine and Russia, we have already, like, um, these are fields. These are exploited fields. So probably exploiting it further will make least harm uh, until until soil gives, gives, up. Yeah. Uh, gives something. But until yes you are right but in brazil it will be a disaster it will be a total disaster if the amazon forest is under further threat so so when you guys here regenerate and our american colleagues regenerate let us think what happens in the amazon where the big egg will be just you know uh, uh, clapping hands of joy that uh, there is uh, demand is growing and the pressure on the Amazon forest destroying, uh, increasing. And this, uh, the Amazon forest is crucial for climate, not in terms of carbon, carbon also, climate. but in terms of the water cycle and temperature regime. And <laughs> regenerating our small spot here, making Adam, then, uh, then uh, we. Uh, Export, like, so you're saying our yeah. global climate, yes. So, and it could be even worse than if we continued for some time uh, as it is now here. So, are so you arguing for a, really... or like a, a more, I wouldn't use the word holistic, but a transition? Because it, you say it doesn't make sense to stop um, from one moment to the other so, so, so and create what, Eden yeah, and then yeah, let's. What, all the cattle farming go into Brazil or, or, or the extremely intensive yes, grain yes, production yes. In, in Russia and in Ukraine? Maybe, maybe, look, uh, what I think, uh, what is, um, for example, if there is a land which, like, nothing grows, already desertified, let's go there and increase productivity there, and this will lessen the pressure on the existing ecosystem. If we regenerate from land that doesn't, give anything but if we come to a land that gives a lot even at, at the expense of fertilizers uh, but it gives a lot and decide oh no this land is not sustainably exploited we will make a small piece of like uh, paradise garden here 
then the productivity will decline for sure because the year down. Has yeah, yeah, yeah. And then somebody who was eating this wheat, what he or she will be eating? They will have to uh, uh, to do uh, to, so, so. So uh, I would on a, for I would advise to us as a species just a little bit slow down this uh, replacement of intense agriculture with something that we like more. Let us turn first to already degraded land and try to... Uh, Go to the worst places and, and focus there. Would, yes, you do, yes. would you use that money to do that? Would you go to places yes. that have been severely degraded? Like, But they're far away from the tipping point. So there's also a, a, a difficulty there because if they're far away from like going to the wet climate... You know, it is not uh, always. Uh, there are places that where just the soil was the degraded. There yeah. are still uh, a lot of rainfall, but it is uh, like comes very regularly. So it is um, on a gross scale. It is in the wet regime. It is just requires like keeping moisture in landscape, and uh, so it is not a desert in the sense that there is no rain at all. It is just desertified land in terms of nothing. Gr- grows like the proper soil and and what would you do i mean from another switching the question to because this requires almost a magic wand so that's why i love to ask that question as well if you if you could change one thing in this transition or one thing in general in let's say land use global land use what only one thing what would that be Uh, absolutely Immediate moratorium on the uh, further exploitation of all natural forests. But it might also lead to this pressure is, elsewhere. It, like you're saying, like the, the, the argument you made before, like if we stop, it might lead to a lot more concrete, which has a carbon part. It might lead to, um, so how do we, isn't there also a dare transition needed? Or you say, no, this is too important. We have to stop immediately and we'll figure out like the, the tensions that create like that creates, we'll, we'll figure out a solution to that. We figure out the solution because the solution is there. It is intense. If we speak about wood, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, intense, uh, um, turning to intense uh, uh, silly culture because forests are now, uh, natural forests are now uh, just destroyed due to extensive forestry just when people come to a distant place just cut out uh, everything uh, take for example state money uh, as a subsidy to for for transport expenses and then uh, that's it so destruction and that's it if they instead uh, took like cut what you have grown with with uh, forestry Cut you what you have grown. Uh, leave this forest in peace. And you know that there is this so-called in Russia, for example, state uh, business partnership when the state takes the expenses and the business takes the profit. Uh, and this leads to a, a sort of situation where the least disturbed forests that are distant decidized to be cut because they're very distant and the business wants some subsidy to go there and this to destroy there. So this is not, this destruction is now, uh, occurs at very little through economic profit. Uh, Just so because of weird incentives. So the, you would the, immediately It is not about, you know, it is, it is not about just immediately. And I mean, there, there are a few examples of wh- where you think differently, but just to, to ask the question, John Kempf always likes to ask in a, in a slightly different form, uh, what, are you true to be- what do you believe to be true about regeneration that others don't? So when you go to, um, there must be at least somehow uh, um, more people talking obviously about the biotic pump, about a con- but when you go to a conference where you are with your peers that study this deeply, where, where are you different? Where do you think different? Where are you contrarian among your peers? Uh, well, um, it is not uh, specifically about the regeneration, but about the biotic pump. Uh, I am just uh, 
everywhere contrarian. So it is like my profession almost to be contrarian. Uh, and uh, then uh, the main argument is that uh, which has been with, with which we have been like fighting for for quite some time is that this uh, mechanism of condensation that I type this pressure to drop is uh, significant enough uh, for the forest to have any impact on air circulation. And this uh, this is a like serious argument which requires a serious uh, response. And as we cannot make experiments, like we cannot cut the forest in total and say, oh, you see what happens. No, we uh, experiment now, maybe not. Yeah. Made quite a lot of uh, work to show, to show. For example, with uh, what we did, we start, we showed that the same theory, uh, which explains the biotic bump, uh, explains quantitatively the dynamics of tropical cyclones where the condensation is most intense and uh, strong winds are generated. So we showed that the theory is uh, um, produces uh, as the quantitative estimates that are in agreement with observations. Which shows that this mechanism uh, is uh, powerful enough to generate strong atmospheric motions and strong moisture transfer. So well, it took a lot of effort to really uh, ensure that the concept is viable. Now, fortunately, we are like across the tipping point probably <laughs> and more and more people uh have you seen the conversation the global conversation on this topic and the seriousness as you've been of course in it for such a long time and ridiculed have you seen it change or shift over the last let's say five years and and if so how uh Yes, uh, uh, this is what uh, we are seeing, uh, this uh, positive shift in the seriousness uh, with which people um, perceive our propositions. Uh, and I think that this is due to the fact that we have been working uh, and uh, publishing uh, research results, uh, going through peer review, uh, persuading our opponents. So this is a normal uh, process uh, by which science should progress, I think. And uh, there is always a uh, certain, there might be resistance to new ideas because this is healthy inertia of, of science. Of course, sometimes it is uh, too strong, uh, other times it is less strong, but you must be prepared to survive uh, and so now we are very happy that we seem to have survived to this point when everything uh, has been... Because now it is, uh, yes, the situation has changed. Uh, I think that we are progressing quite nicely at the moment. Is it fair to say you've reached or are very close to the tipping point from a dry to a, a wet regime? Yes, um, unfortunately, uh, yes, the, one can say so, but unfortunately, all this uh, goes hand in hand with the environmental degradation. So the success of our uh, research uh, is uh, like maybe facilitated by the uh, by what people see around. So, so I'd better prefer that. We remain unsuccessful, but the biosphere heals itself. <laughs> but but yeah, no, I don't of course, know. Of course, but that's so, that's not uh, that doesn't seem to be. I mean, yeah, we're we're saying in the yeah. pre-interview, um, unfortunately. But at the moment, yes, it. we are trying with our research. We're trying to persuade. Yeah, we are trying to persuade people that uh, ecosystems are really crucial for stability of our climate. And any final, I mean, that, that's probably the most important message. I, I don't know a, a better way to, to end this conversation um, than, than that point. It's really, really crucial, even if you don't care on carbon or I mean, potentially even biodiversity, but just simply in terms of regulating and, and stabilizing the, the global climate, which wherever you are, you're a part of, unless you float in space. Uh, it's absolutely crucial to do so. So I want to thank you so much, first of all, for the work you do and, and for 
um, keep, let's say, hanging in there uh, in, in all the pressure against you and, and the ridicule, which is a healthy part of science, but still not an easy um, process to be in. And, and hopefully uh, we're close to close to the tipping point in that sense. So thank you so much for coming on here to take the time for, of course, for all the work you do, the travels and, and for the inspirational part you're, you're playing in this movement. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.